One of the first questions to ask when you're going sea fishing, particularly for the first time, is where do you want to fish? <laughs> where are you going to fish? Well, there's some reasons why we've chosen this venue today, but I'm going to turn you around now. Because <laughs> when you look at the coast, it looks pretty flat and featureless a lot of the time. So where on earth do you start? Well, <laughs> one of the places to start is going to be somewhere like Facebook, believe it or not. Look at the catch reports on there, what's being caught. Check out Sea Angler magazine. The magazine's running some recent articles on uh, a where to fish guide. Have a look at what's local to you and start from there. The other option, of course, is speak to other people. Other people know uh, where you might want to go. So uh, for me, I actually overheard a conversation in a tackle shop the other day that some sole might be caught along here. These conditions here, not very conducive to the lure fishing that we normally do. Uh, which is why I've decided to put some bait in the water today. And it looks flat and featureless. But one thing you can do is look at the ground on a Navionics app. You can see it here. And that'll tell you the lie of the land underneath the water, the depth of the water as well. Check out Google Earth Pro. That'll give you a really good idea of what's under the water. The third option, and maybe the best option, is come down to a venue at low tide. That way you'll see things like the rocks, the snags under the water and maybe some fish holding features like gullies uh, and sandbanks, things like that. So do a little bit of research, but don't get obsessed with it because what we really want to do and what I want to do today is get out there and go fishing. What have I got in front of me? Let's have a look. So in many ways, a flat, featureless beach, but we've done a little bit of preparation here and I know that there's rocks out there to the left, for instance, and we want to have a little look at the weather as well. So certain marks, fish differently in different conditions. Uh, we're looking at this one here, we've got southwesterlies coming in. And southwesterlies generally here produce a nice little surf and the wind is pushing into our face, so something to consider. There's actually somebody fishing out, there's someone fishing out on that little jetty there, uh, which is possibly another option. So they're fishing for mackerel, but unfortunately for them, I think the conditions are a bit cloudy for those mackerel. Um, so we're gonna go off the beach here today and I'm gonna push out, punch a bait into the wind uh, and the water's quite what we call colored and that means um, those predatory fish, fish like bass and mackerel, are unlikely to be hunting the live bait in this. It is possible, but I think our efforts are best served using some lugworm and perhaps trying for some Dover sole. It is worth having a target species in mind, uh, but you've got to be ready to adapt as well. If you see someone else catching something, you might want to swap over. So there we go, a bit of bright sunlight. And the reason I'm here as well, if you look, um, if you look at that wall, we've got the wind coming over the top and it does afford us, it affords us just a little bit of wind cover. You may want to consider getting something like a beach shelter when the wind's really bad. Well, I've never fished here before. <laughs> Uh, but I want to run through some of the thought processes that, that go through my head when I'm fishing a new venue. And actually, as I look at it, you can see behind, but behind that is a red pole and that marked an out water outfall. And if you look a little bit closer, you can see, looks to me like, looks to me like the currents and the waves are moving a little bit more there, which is a little bit more interesting for the fishing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move and that looks a little bit more interesting to me. We can put a bait over the end of it. I think we'll have a better chance. I prefer this beach profile. It's going to be a little bit harder pushing in the wind, but that's why we're going to be there. So one tip, this is something I'm not doing well. Should really have a rod bag uh, to put these rods in. They come in individual bags, but you either need like a quiver bag to keep them all in. That way you're not going to damage the tips, which I do all the time. I haven't learned very well. <laughs> so. I'm not going to go on to that jetty, too slippery, and you can see the waves pushing on here. But we'll do it from the beach. I'm just going to hit a bait out from about here, I think. But where do we set up our gear? <laughs> it all depends on what the tide's doing. Now, tides are really important. I like to fish bigger tides, what we call, call these spring tides. The tide goes out further, and the tide comes up higher as well more movement of water generally generally leads to better fishing. Um, at the moment though, we're on what we call neap tides, where the difference between the high tide and the low tide is at its bit harder. There's various reasons for that. 
a lot of it, some people say, is the tides are so strong out there in the channel, it brings fish in. I'm not sure, but looking back on my catch reports, um, better fish have come during a big... And then as we look around now, we need to know if the tide's going in or out. So is it on the flood, which means the tide's going in, or is it on the ebb, which means the tide's going out? Those of you should know. <laughs> There's a few clues you can look at. We've checked our tide tables, and we know the tide is going out. So that affects where we put this. We don't want to keep moving our gear back and back and back. I keep everything in this box. Uh, can keep stuff dry. I've got all the tackle and stuff I need in there. Best to travel as light as you can, but when it's a new venue, I've got a few extras in there. These rod rests are really good. This is an Ian Gold's rod rest. Digs into the shingle really well. Stood the test of time. So the wind direction's coming this way. The rods are going to be out that way into the wind. I've got a right angle into the wind. Two types of rod today. This is a multiply rod and this is using a multiply reel. We'll have a look at that as well, but for now, the rod still goes together with that joint into the other section. You've got a male section and a female section. Now, if you're anything like me, it's always worth, uh, depending on where you look after your rods, it's always worth just making sure that this is clear of any grit because it will start to break the rod uh, if you push down on, and scratch on that carbon. So yeah, I would wipe that, just give it a little wipe, maybe even just with your so hands. This next rod we so those go together, nice push yeah. fit in there, pushes in quite nicely in there. And then you just want to make sure the eyes are lined up. So you can see there it's offset, and you'll be able to look down at those eyes. So this next rod we're using is a, is a different beast entirely. It's a continental rod from Colmit. Of the differences between the two rods, um, it's a slimmer blank as well. This is referred to as the blank. And when you compare the two, it's more, it's more of an old fashioned rod really, the sands. It's thicker, but there's a lot of power in this and it's a lot more enjoyable to use. There's a difference in the standard of the rod rings as well. These are quite cheap. These are actually fake Fuji rings. You'll see some rods are manufactured and they say Fuji. Um, well, I think in the old days, Daiwa made these to look like Fuji. Made them to look like Fuji, but they weren't. <laughs> Quality on the rod rings on the Colmic. And that's a three-piece. The Colmic's a three-piece rod as well. So these are the rigs. We've got a lot of rig making videos on the channel, actually. You can see them here. I'll leave a little pop-up for you. Um, these are rig winders. These foam things are rig winders, colour-coded depending on the rig. That's a theory anyway. Um, and what I found was I was using certain rigs for 90% of the fish I caught. So here we've got what we call a three-hook flapper of size 4 or size 2. Uh, and, that, and that's what we're going to put some lugworm on today. And lugworm is a good general bait, catches fish around here. Um, and catches sort of 80, 90% of the stuff here will be caught on lugworm only, so it's a really good bait. Just going to have a little break now, um, and I want to talk to you about Skillshare. Now, Skillshare are the sponsors of this video. Thank you, Skillshare. And if you haven't heard about them, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there's no ads like this one, and they're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused and follow where your creativity takes you. Skillshare is really good. I've tried it myself. Take a look at these classes here. I know there's a lot of us that use GoPros to film our fishing adventures. Well, Greg Hun's got us covered here with his GoPro 8 Beyond Next Level. I particularly liked Ali Abdul's video editing with Final Cut Pro 10 from beginner to YouTuber. There's some really good tips in here, uh, not just with things like color grading, uh, shortcuts, things like that, but also I really like the class project idea. So you sort of work on some footage that's provided for you. Uh, it has that real sense of community. So that's definitely one I'd recommend as well. First 1,000 of my subscribers that click the link in the description below will get one month 
free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Members get unlimited access to thousands of inspiring classes with those hands-on projects. Most of the classes are 60 minutes with short lessons to fit any schedule. Yeah, the only slight variety with the rig, sometimes I'll use these uh, floating beads or pop-up beads and that has the advantage of lifting the hook up above the seabed um, and when you've got things like spider crabs or those swimmer crabs that we looked at in the last video, um, these can be invaluable really, stop the crabs or at least give the fish a chance of getting the bait. Um, so occasionally I'll put those on there but I like to keep it very, very simple. If you look at match anglers, they'll have a bigger variety of, of rigs to suit certain conditions and their hook snoods uh, will vary as well depending on the uh, type of current they're fishing over. But we'll set this first one up using a three hook flapper, using the worms and that's just a basic bait. So setting up this continental rod, we're going to use uh, the fixed ball reel. This is a fixed ball reel, you see that bright orange line on there? That's known as a leader, a leader line, and this is actually a tapered leader, which means the line we're going to so which means the line we're taking up the rod is really thick. Where it joins the main line under there is the same diameter, and it just makes for a smoother cast. Whereas the weight and the power of the cast is taken up by the thicker part of that leader line. You've got this screw type fitting on here, makes it a lot easier. Um, so you screw that on there. And then I find the easiest way to take the line off is actually use the drag. Um, so if you take the line off here, let me still show you. This bit here is called the bail arm. This bit here is the bail arm. Uh, but this drag at the end, when you loosen that, you can put a line off like that. If you want to change rigs quickly, you just put the, the new one on, old one off, new one on. bend these against themselves, tighten them up uh, so they hold a little bit tighter. But they're excellent, a really good invention. This is the other thing they've got as well. So what this does is you put the bottom hook of your rig, Jay's rigs actually make up all my bottom hooks on the Cascade rig to fit onto these breakaway lead. Sits on there like that. When that lead lands in the water, that cone pushes up the hook off. Water pushes up, the pressure of the water will push up and clip that up and that's got the advantage of keeping that bait on there nicely presented which is what you want. Sim this is just a simple off the ground cast putting the lead on the beach using the power of the rod just to push it out a little bit. We do have a couple of videos on casting uh, where I'm joined by Brian Pask on the video, which is up at the top there. So the lugworm, so the lugworm here, this is wrapped from a shop. Uh, they put it in paper 
and you can see here it's actually been in the fridge a while so these aren't the best condition worms so these aren't necessarily the best condition worms these but the sole so the target species today sole they don't seem to mind them being a bit stinky and smelly um, so we'll put those on the hook they are just about still alive and then we might tip that with a bit of squid as well we're almost at the start <laughs> we're almost at the stage where we can start fishing uh, there's a little sequin on here and a stop knot that does to a certain degree stop the uh, worm flying up the hook um, so thread that on I would say these worms are in quite bad condition um, you're looking for live worms really uh, still just about fresh enough but uh, they're not real they're not real wrigglers a few other things you can bring when you're fishing uh, this is like a sea match measure um, and all I've done is I've just added the minimum size takeable size for various fish that I might hope to catch um, that's all on there uh, and then you just lay the fish you catch a fish you just lay it on there you can measure it see if it's a keepable size but that's quite a good thing to have a spare spool there as well uh, for our fixed spool reel although we're using braid um, sometimes a little bit easier to use the monofilament fishing off the beach it's a little bit more forgiving in the cast got a bit of a bend to it but it's always handy just to just have a spare spool uh, with a leader on it already uh, which we haven't got uh, and I'll always bring some tapered leaders with me as well uh, you see there it goes from 15 pounds to 60 pound so 60 pound is the bit you put the rig on 15 pound is the bit that you are attaching to your main line always bring a bit of electrical tape whether it's as a an emergency plaster uh, or to fix anything strap rods together all sorts of things i've used that for bait elastic if you've got about 300 of these scattered everywhere that's the best bet uh, ideal for strapping baits like or squid wrap squid on peeler crab um, i've always got loads of those very occasionally i'll forget it and it's a nightmare you can't bait up properly <laughs> but definitely have some of those in your tackle box so i've left that bait in there now for about 20 minutes and in those conditions that's enough for the lug to be washed out uh, so we'll bring it back in what i'm going to do now is pull into that and you'll see that the rod tip bends right away round and it looks like we've got something heavy but all that is are those grip leads um, just holding fast and then they'll pull out I haven't seen any little taps on the rod which is what we're looking for I don't think there's a fish on there but let's have a look 